Good evening, everybody. How are you? Welcome to the April installment of Alta's California Book Club. Tonight, uh, our guest is Miriam Gerba, and she will be in conversation with Gustavo Arellano. I'm David L. Ulin, the books editor of Alta Journal. And I'm just going to set up a couple things before we jump into the conversation. I'm um, really looking forward to this talk, and I'm delighted that you've all uh, joined us. Um, for those of you who don't know Alta, we're a quarterly print journal, um, also putting out a, a lot of pieces um, on, on a regular basis on the web. Um, we are covering books in online book reviews and also in, um, in, in, in sections in the print journal, as well as um, events such as the California Book Club. The California Book Club is a monthly book club um, under the auspices of Alta that uh, looks at the literature of California, um, which is uh, among the most vibrant literature uh, in the United States right now. Um, we are, I would like to briefly just introduce our partners um, without whom we couldn't do this. They include Book Passage, Books Inc., Book Soup, Bookshop, Diesel, the bookstore, the Huntington USC Institute on California and the West, the Los Angeles Public Library, the San Francisco Public Library, Narrative Magazine, Roman's Bookstore, and Ziziva. Uh, I also have been asked to uh, present an offer for California Book Club members. Uh, if you are a member of the California Book Club, you can get a year of Alta print magazine, a California Book Club tote bag. I'll do my NPR thing here. There it is, it's a sturdy uh, bag with a nifty outside pocket, um, and a free copy of one upcoming California Book Club title all for just $50. So watch tomorrow's thank you email for a link to this deal. It'll be your last chance. The membership discount ends this month. You can find that at altaonline.com slash CBC offer. Um, and now I would like to turn this over to my former colleague, Gustavo Arellano from the Los Angeles Times, a contributing editor to Alta as well. Um, Gustavo, welcome. All right. I cannot start the video because the host has stopped it. So hopefully the host can start my video for me because otherwise, oh, I, now I could start my video. So here we go. Let my face show. Here we go. Hi. Welcome, everyone. I hope you are at home and not driving somewhere, although it'd be cool to have us on Zoom as well. And listen, I'm Gustavo Ariano, columnist for the Los Angeles Times, contributing editor to uh, Alta, awesome journal. Pick up the most uh, recent issue. There's a piece by me on my love for the VW bus and also my hesitancy with the uh, all electric bus that's supposed to come out in 2022. And it makes me so happy to be able to talk about this book right here that you should all have right now. And if you don't have it yet, what are you waiting for? Go online, not Amazon, go to Romans, go to all these wonderful uh, partners that we have and buy this book. Mean. Simple title, straight to the point, me by Miriam Gerba, who is one of my favorite writers. And I'm not just saying it because I know her. I really mean it. I first came across her work, I think it was 2015, 2016. It's been a couple of years now, but I knew her for short stories. I knew her for her essays. I knew her not just for the written word, but also how she presented the word at, you know, at readings, performance art, whatever you want to call it. She was just, como se dice en español, like. I can't even, like I'm saying, who, how do you bring it in Spanish? But she just brings it. She always brought it. Fucking brilliant. Fucking <laughs> amazing. Just, oh, like, such, like, just, I, like, especially, like, let me get to it, obviously. But if most of you, so she did that, then she came out with this book, which we're going to talk about, of course. Uh, so I'll leave my comments for a little bit. And then most of you, if you have never heard of Miriam before, maybe a couple years ago, you definitely heard about her after um, her, uh, essay, her review of American Dirt by Janine Cummins, which maybe we'll talk about a little bit, but this is a book club, so we're going to focus mostly about book. Uh, it reminds what the whole uproar about her essay, Miriam's essay afterwards, reminded me of what Abraham Lincoln supposedly told Harriet Beecher Stowe when she met her, when he met her, it's like, oh, so you're the woman who started this great war. In this case, with Miriam's essay, she's the one who started all this, this madre, and a very much needed reckoning in the book industry when it comes to representation, especially when it comes to Latinx writers. I've also been, you know, I, I find myself fortunate to be able to say that I know Miriam out 
we're, you know, I, I would say we're kind of friends. Uh, you know, I think so. I think she's amazing more than anything. Um, and, you know, I could go on and on, but I'd rather you folks are not here to hear me. You're here to talk, you know, to hear to Miriam. So Miriam, uh, welcome to this chat. Thank you. <laughs> it's special to be here. What a special introduction. Thank you. No, I've, it, got, it, I've got my book here too. <laughs> yeah, we all better have your books, you know. Um, no, no, I, I really mean it. And the, and the one thing I forgot to say, like, and we'll get to it later on, but uh, Miriam's writing, honestly, all the time reminds me of, you know, what, like that the specific phrase of Mark Twain when he reviewed the works of James Feminor Cooper, just like, just ruthless, ruthless, but funny, brilliant. And specifically with this book, I see this book it's a bunch of bees. It's beautiful. It's brash. It's it's bitchy. It's specific. <laughs> it's bold. It is just you know. And I hate this cliche, but I'm going with the bees. It's badass. So what we're gonna do is just talk about the book. Talk you know. We're gonna focus mostly on the book. I'm gonna have I'm gonna have some other questions for Miriam, of course, outside of the book industry. You know, outside of this particular book. If you folks have any questions, we're not doing chat today, but please, we do have a Q and A little segment right there. We'll definitely get to your questions. And then, yeah, we're just gonna have a great one hour conversation. So Miriam, I guess I'll start with the big one, which is, are there any other memoirs about Santa Maria, California? <laughs> um, I don't think that there have been any memoirs that center Santa Maria. Santa Maria appears fleetingly in work so Santa Maria is one of those communities that's mentioned, but I don't think that there has been like any other um, book length work that has, <laughs> that has uh, unfolded in Santa Maria as, as like a literary stage. But what, I'm still writing about Santa Maria. I've written quite a bit about Santa Maria and I'm working um, on some essays that feature Santa Maria and Santa Maria history right now. Because what I find about specifically mean, and of course other writings, is that it's such a reflection of what Santa Maria is. You know, if the rest of California knows it, oh, Santa Maria barbecue, the Santa Maria Valley, the wines, and it makes it out to almost this, like, this bucolic wonderland. But there is so much pain. There's so much racism. There's so much just bullshit in Santa Maria. And I, you know, and, and so to read your memoir is you know memoir slash really um treatise on santa maria was just so refreshing to read so we'll let's start at the beginning how <laughs> we'll, you know talk a little bit about santa maria i love your description of it like if you wanted to sum it up it was strawberry fields asparagus um uh, what was it uh strip malls and michael jackson workers yeah like uh so so I was born in Santa Maria and raised in Santa Maria. I was born there in the 70s and it was a very small town that grew exponentially during the 18 years that I called it home, right? And I would characterize the town that I grew up in as semi-rural. Um, the first home that I recall uh, was on uh, a street called Sway Road and there were strawberry fields across the street from us. There were horse stables uh, at the end of the road. Um, and then beyond the strawberry, strawberry fields were canyons and a dump. You know what I mean? This, yeah. is, this is where I grew up. And then I, 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 I would often, I often joke that depending on which way the wind blows, it either smells like strawberries or cow shit. You know <laughs> what I mean? So, <laughs> so um, that that that's sort of the essence of Santa Maria. It's either incredibly sweet or incredibly foul, and that was uh, something that I wanted to represent when I wrote Mean. And one of the um, the aspects of Santa Maria that I was really interested in representing when I wrote Mean was uh, the community's racial politics. Yeah. Um, especially as those racial politics play out within Santa Barbara County. Santa Barbara County is inc an incredibly wealthy county, but that wealth is concentrated in Santa Barbara and more specifically in Montecito. 
Yeah. And the disparity is incredible. Santa Barbara is one of um, the richest cities in California. And then you've got Santa Maria and um, and Santa Maria is where the manpower resides because it's where brown people live. Yeah. It's where brown people in Santa Barbara County live. And um, as you were mentioning earlier, I, I, I typify Santa Maria as a place where you've got um, an abundance of agriculture. And so you've got a labor force that has to keep the agricultural industry um, thriving. Um, and then all throughout Santa Barbara County and surrounding areas, you've got a lot of celebrities and other wealthy folks who come to vacation, who come to summer, um, and, and you've got uh, celebrities like the late Michael Jackson who have these rambling ranches. And who operates those ranches? You've got Mexicans and Central Americans operating those ranches. Yeah. Um, and so what I wanted to do was to take the spotlight off of the glamour that, um, that uh, the spotlight typically attracts and to place the spotlight on those of us who are behind the scenes, those of us who who cobble the glamour and hold the glamour up. Yeah. That and, was and, who I wanted to shine that light on. And I think that is such a one of the most that's one of the most underrated aspects of your book. As a Californian, it is such a blistering critique of the California dream. Even though, of course, most of the national praise, rightfully so, talks about just you know the, in your book how it the, the, you know how it shows the continued violence against women from all ages sexual assaults and the racism. But what's amazing and so disturbing about your book is how it unschools. You start off, you know, in kindergarten, well, you know, through elementary school, and it's not necessarily an idyllic experience, but you have, you know, you're young, the daughter of Mexican and a, you know, Polish guy, a quarter Polish or a half Polish, I forget. And, and at first it starts like, okay, you're like a kid, everything's good, you know, kids are gonna be dumb. And then by high school, like you see, I mean, you know, you've already suffered through so much bullshit. And what really got me, I think it was in high school where you have the boyfriend of a guy, of, of a girlfriend of yours who says, oh, what are you? Oh, I'm Mexican. And you're trying, and then he sees that, you see how disgusted he is. I was like, where do you get your green eyes? And you're like, oh, well, I'm Polish too. And then he says this line, oh, you're a Mexican and you're a Pole. You're like the dumbest, two dumbest people on the planet. And it's disgusting. It's like, in this time period, Santa Maria has just gotten worse and worse and worse. Yeah. And um, and that xenophobia and that specific anti-Mexican sentiment was very strongly cultivated by our city's leadership. Yeah. Um, and so uh, I grew up under the regime of Mayor George Hobbs. Um, George Hobbs was known as Mr. Santa Maria. And he was mayor for far too long. And he campaigned one year um, according to an anti-Mexican platform. That was his entire campaign. His, uh, his campaign uh, called for the repatriation of Mexicans who he argued were destroying Santa Maria. Hmm. Uh, he said that Mexicans were making Santa Maria look unlike itself. Um, and he suggested a solution, and that was to remove Mexicans who were making the community look unlike itself and to deport us to colonies, which would be erected along the US-Mexico border. And his wish came true. His wish yeah. absolutely came true. His wish was, um, was taken up or his torch was taken up by President Donald Trump. And so when Donald Trump appeared in uh, the lobby of Trump Tower in order to kick off his campaign speech, what I heard was the ghost of George Hobbs speaking. I thought to myself, this is nothing new. And so when um, the media portrayed Trump as this uh, iconoclastic anti-Mexican, I thought, no, he's not. This is the type of bigotry that I've lived through for decades. And this is homegrown bigotry. It's not grown in the Midwest. It's not grown in the East Coast. This is a California export. Yeah, no, absolutely. You're going to read a couple of passages from me. So uh, start, start us off. Tell us what page you're going to uh, read from so we can all read at home and then we'll talk about it. 
Okie dokie. Um, so I can go ahead and read one of the much shorter chapters. Um, I can read um, Google Plex. That is on page 19. All right. Everyone get your books. Page 19, <laughs> read along. La maestra, uh, la maestra Miriam va a leer ahorita. <laughs> Uh, so I'll go, I think, um, I'll go ahead and read the whole thing since it's incredibly short. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, Google Plex. And for anybody who's dropped in, who hasn't read the book, I'm going to go ahead and preface it super, super briefly. Um, what I'll say is that, um, that, uh, this very short chapter is about, uh, the playground um, it takes place during my fifth grade year, and the character that I'm referring to, Ida, was uh, a white girl who was uh, my childhood best friend. And of course, uh, Ida's a, a pseudonym that I chose for my friend. Okay, I'll go ahead and begin. Google Plex. Although Ida was white, she sort of wasn't. She looked like Kurt Cobain. She attended bilingual classes with me and spoke and understood Spanish. She kicked it with Mexicans on the playground and learned how to play handball. When she came over to my house, she slurped mom's pozole instead of asking, what is this? In that supremely bitchy California girl accent, some white girls reserved for interrogating my mother's hospitality. The fifth grade race war proved Ida's racial solidarity. An Asian American child fired the first shots. She stood near me in the playground sand by the handball courts. She looked me up and down and said, your mother is a wetback. I lost control of my limbs. My hands attacked her and they shoved her chest, making her lose her balance and fall to the sand. My toes flew into her stomach. My Velcro shoes landed blow after blow. Her round face winced and the bell rang. Recess was over. I quit kicking. She ran away crying. She didn't tell any grown-ups what had happened, but the fifth grade girls balkanized soon after. White girls from the English only classes refused to socialize with girls from bilingual classes. Looking at the jungle gym and tetherball courts, our segregation was clear as melanin. Clusters of girls named Lupe played together. Clusters of girls named Michelle played together. Lupe's and Michelle's didn't mix. The playground felt dicey and tribal. From the jungle gym bars, a dangling white girl, Amy, called, go back to Baja. Her taunt seemed aimed at both Ida and me. We paused beside the merry-go-round. I turned to Ida. Have you ever been to Mexico? I asked her. Ida shook her head. No, she answered, but I'd go with you. You would love it, I told her. The food is really good there. My uncle got his head cut off by a bus. The cockroaches fly. Really? I nodded. Amy screamed, Ida loves wet backs. Ida screamed, fuck your mother in the tit. I felt like hugging Ida. I'm not sure where she learned that comeback. Her mother did work for a gynecologist. Her father lived in Colorado and worked for the defense industry. Ida was so smart. Her favorite number was Google Plex. The balkanization and screaming drew our teachers outside. They decided they needed to fix things. They informed us that we were gonna have to sit down and talk about it. After lunch, a male teacher marched the boys to the blacktop to play dodgeball. Girls got herded into the English only classroom. I stared at the boys through tinted windows. My skin felt jealous. I didn't want to be inside. So prodded the English only teacher, what's going on? She stood by the board, she folded her arms, she was dressed entirely in purple. The white girl sat on the opposite side of the classroom and desks facing ours. They blinked at us. We blinked back. I raised my hand. The English only teacher said, go ahead. I pointed at the lot of them and said, they call us wetbacks and tell us to go back to Mexico. Those girls are racists and she's not even Mexican. I pointed at Ida. Ida nodded. White lower lips quivered. White eyes grew glassy. One by one, white girls burst into tears. Ida and all the Mexican girls looked at each other like, seriously? 
apologized for making them cry, said the English only teacher. Sorry, I said without any sincerity. You're muted. Always muted, mute, 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 mute. That's how I teach myself not to mute myself anymore. <laughs> well, what I love about this passage is you get some of like the, not, not a, it's not even a stock character because she's real, like Ida. There's always going to be that token huera who's just cool with las mexicanas and gets us. Like the fact that she's coming in to eat the pozole and then the accent that you did, the you know, Valley Girl website, what is this? Like it exists. It absolutely exists. Oh, and, this, and she was down. She, <laughs> she was down. Yeah, down. yeah. It's like she was in all bilingual classes. Like she had these kind of like former hippie parents that had become, they were on the path to conservatism, but they still had enough of that in them. That they were gonna stick this girl in bilingual classes. And then she decided to like pal around with me. Like we were like this, you know what I mean? Yeah. And then um, when she would come to our house, cause she spent a lot of time in our house growing up, my father would tell her, you're in a Mexican house, girl. You're gonna speak Spanish. And so my dad would only talk to her in Spanish and he would only answer her if she answered in Spanish and she was down. <laughs> she understood the rules in our house. Yeah. <laughs> that is so cool. And the, what's amazing, what's awesome about this book is like you have like these, you know, instead of doing one long narrative, as you see most memoirs, and that's perfectly fine, you chop it up into all these little chapters. It really reminds me of this, you know, the, this idea in Latin American literature of cuentos. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about cuentos and how it did or didn't influence your thinking and writing me. That's an interesting question. I haven't been asked that question before. And I'll say that when I began the process of writing mean, I didn't intend to write a book length manuscript. I was writing fragments. Yeah. And so as I engaged in the execution of those fragments, I began to think of the fragments as, um, as, as part of a larger organism, but I wasn't sure how I was going to bring the pieces together to sort of bring Frankenstein to life, right? So that took, that took time. Um, but my family is a family of storytellers. Um, and my family is like, the members of my family are like uh, very kind of informally devoted to like a bardic tradition in the sense that we're committed to orality. We sit together and when we sit together, all we do is talk. I'm a compulsive talker because I was socialized and raised by compulsive talkers. And one of my favorite things during childhood was I'm during visits to Mexico, we would go to like my abuelita's house and then all of the extended family converges on the house. We meet like in the living room or the dining room, everybody sits in a circle. And then one tia sort of initiates the storytelling and that's it. And you're there for four hours, sort of peering at one another through smoke. Cause there's always some people smoking way too much, smoking like actual cigarettes. They're not vaping. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that was really seductive for me as a child. Like I, I, I wanted to crawl into those stories and live in them. And then as I began to age and to mature, I would engage in like soliciting those stories. So I would kind of needle the adults in my family into sharing those stories. And so they taught me to narrate and um, they taught me to tell stories, but you wouldn't have one person dominating that circle. Yeah. It would be different talking heads. So one person might tell the story of the evening that so-and-so spirit showed up in the kitchen. And then that reminds the other person about the time that so-and-so's dog got run over by a bus. And then that reminds somebody else of the time that I, you know, somebody left too many rocks in the beans and then somebody broke their teeth. You know what I mean? And so it's like, okay. there's all this sort of back and forth. And then from that back and forth, you get a composite picture of the family as opposed to one lead sort of bardic narrator. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, totally. It's in, yeah. in other words, it's not this big Homeric epic of one person gets your attention for the entire night. It's just, you know, it's, oh, this person says that and that person says that. And with me, there's all these different stories 
some hilarious, some disturbing, but all connect into your, I mean, it's your memoir. So it's your memoir. It's this place. It's also about, you know, key moments in your life and not just key moments in your life, but again, the ghost, the spectra of not just the woman who got murdered by the man who sexually assaulted you, but also just all the violence that women have faced from men since the beginning of time. It's, it's, it's really disturbing and, and the just, it, it really grabs you and also makes you laugh at the same time. So just a quick reminder here for folks, please ask questions in the Q&A thing right there, send them to me, I will ask them. So I'll start with, we don't got names for them, but that's okay. So here's a question for you, Miriam. What were some of your blind spots that you discovered while writing about misogyny, violence, and coming of age in California? Realizations that may have departed from your original vision or intent with your memoir, and how did you navigate writing about that? Um, so, uh, let's see. I... I had um, a lot of ambition when it came to um, investigating the crimes or the harms that were perpetrated by the assailant that I uh, that I discuss in Mean. I had I had a lot of ambition, and I wasn't able to realize um, those investigative ambitions because. I was working full time as a high school teacher when I wrote that book. And so I didn't have the financial luxury and I didn't have the luxury of time in order to do the sort of research that I really wanted to do. And so that was thwarted. Right now, I'm reflecting a lot on that very set of questions. And I'm writing about that very set of questions. Uh, because I'm uh, working on an essay collection. And one of the essays in that collection is about the experience of writing mean and the process mm -hmm. of writing mean. And um, mean became, uh, mean became a place for me. I mean, it was a manuscript, but it was also a place that I, that I uh, built through words. Um, and it became a place where I could sort of psychologically go home um, and, uh, and hide out. Um, mean took me several years to write. Most yeah. of the writing happened over the span of about a year and a half. And during that time, I was trapped in an abusive relationship that involved quite a bit of domestic violence. And uh, the person who I was trapped with was a misogynist and he was anti-feminist. And, um, and so I was able to hide from him when I worked on that manuscript. I was able to sort of go home and, uh, and go into my imagination in order to, to take refuge from him. And so those questions of misogyny are questions that I'm revisiting in the process of, um, of, of writing that essay. And when Mean was released in 2017, its publication coincided with the rise of the Me Too movement. And uh, Mean was written about as a Me Too text and as a Me Too narrative. And that was purely coincidental I yeah, you're, you're, you're not giving yourself enough credit. Sorry for interrupting here, but you are really a prophetess. You, you know, we all know we're, we're all book lovers here. So we know like you turn in something that had been worked on for years. And then when you turn it in, it still takes nine months to do. And then it came out just like you writing about American Dirt and you writing about, um, you know, about me too, in a way, it's not coincidence, Miriam. It's, <laughs> it's your brilliance. It really is. Thank you for saying that. I appreciate that. Um, so... So when Mean was published in the fall of 2017, because of the, the situation that I was in, uh, I was unable to do the sort of press that I wanted to do for the book. And, um, and I, I had to cancel a lot of press. Wow. Um, because the person who uh, was abusing me would actually listen to my interviews and confront me about statements I made during interviews because he was a misogynist and he didn't want people to know what was happening in our home. And so, uh, and so I, 
I'm writing now about the irony of um, of publishing a book that was hailed as a Me Too narrative while I could not address misogyny publicly for fear of what would happen to me when I got home. So that's, th those are themes that I'm exploring right now and I'm trying to think through right now. And it's incredible because you write in the book how you had the, uh, you know, you had the opportunity to be on the witness stand about your sexual assault when the murder trial, uh, you know, of, of the victim, Sofia Torres, and you chose not to. And, and you, you talk at length, it's this really great, a couple of passages just about the idea of the stories you can share, and when you share, you still withhold some things to yourself. So in this case, you know, this very traumatic uh, moment in your life, now all of a sudden became your refuge, at least the exploration of it, the exploration of how it impacted your life, how it, and what it means about the bigger things when it comes to women and violence from men. Yeah, exactly. And in, in retrospect, what I think I was engaged in was this process of constructing this sort of like elaborate literary assemblage that was mine and mine alone. Yeah. And it was it was something that that the person who I was living with couldn't touch and couldn't access. So it was one of the few places where I could actually have privacy. And even though it was an exploration of I'm um, my sort of darkest history, so to speak, that history was also tempered by warmth because I also had the opportunity to explore the very warm parts of home and the warm parts of my upbringing. So it was, it was a really strange experience. Yeah, uh, from Cassidy, you talked about structure. Uh, she, she asks, I am not a big fan of memoirs, but mean feels different than a typical memoir. I loved it. Is there a trope or style or something typical of memoirs that you specifically wanted to depart from or include that isn't normally a memoirs? Yes, absolutely. So when I was working on Mean, there were two books that I was reacting to. So are you being harassed by a mosquito? It's California, so you know it's Southern California. Global warming, folks. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I think I heard it earlier. Is no, it like I, I didn't hear it. I would have heard that whatever. Oh, been maybe I'm hallucinating or maybe like <laughs> my, my, my brain sort of filled in and like provided a, a soundtrack to your, to your struggle. Um, so, it's all good. There, <laughs> so there were two books that I was reacting to when I wrote Mean. So in some regards, Mean can be thought of as a reactionary text. And those two works were Lucky by Alice Siebold and um, The Red Parts by Maggie Nelson. And uh, both of those works are brilliant. They're both different from one another. Um, Lucky by Alice Siebold is um, a very linear, very spare, very elegant um, narration of Siebold's experience uh, of sexual assault while she was uh, at university. And then Maggie Nelson's The Red Parts is a memoir about um, the murder trial of an assailant who um, killed her, her aunt. And it also is, um, is is, is very sort of linear and elegant in its storytelling. Both of those uh, books were incredibly popular um, and widely read, and they both adhere to what I would typify as a white aesthetic. And yeah. I was entirely disinterested in that, but what I was noticing at the time that I was thinking about mean and writing mean was that the popularity of both of those narratives was having quite a bit of influence on storytelling habits, especially storytelling habits as they relate to narratives that center sexual assault, gendered violence, and sexual trauma. And I think, I think that when storytelling habits kind of ossify, that's limiting for writers. 
And I think that when um, sexual assault victims, sexual assault survivors, survivors of gendered violence are expected to follow a template for narrative or for storytelling, uh, that that robs us of freedom, yeah. that takes agency from us. And I think that one indication that a victim or a survivor of that type of violence is healing is um, our ability and our willingness to engage in spontaneity. But if you've got these ossified storytelling habits that, um, that prevents that sort of spontaneity from happening because you can't play and you can't experiment without spontaneity. And so what I wanted to do was challenge myself to engage in play and experimentation and spontaneity and writing by writing against the conventions that I found in both of those works. Yeah, you never want to be ossified, ever. I mean, and all, and, and you, you, you bring, I mean, just literally, you don't want to be ossified. That's, that's the whole human experience. We fight against ossification, but it's, especially when it comes to, you know, survivors of sexual assault. I covered the Catholic Church sex abuse scandal for years and years and years, and there is no one single narrative, and anyone who tries to put these survivors in that narrative, it's like the worst form of patriarchy. Absolutely. And one of the things that I was most bothered by was the expectation that people who have survived ordeals like uh, the sexual assault that I experienced in 1996 and what Tommy Martinez, other victims experienced was this notion that we need to talk about what happened to us um, with solemnity and with almost like a, 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 like a reverential approach. And what I say to people is sexual assault is one of the most disgusting and horrific things that can happen to a person. Why should I then have to write about it in a nearly sacral tone? Yeah. If what somebody did to me is repulsive and repugnant, shouldn't then I be able to write according to a disgusting and repugnant uh, sensibility? Shouldn't I be able to bring that to um, my, my, my narrative. And one of the things, one of the elements that is largely absent from um, trauma narratives is humor. Yes. And I think that humor, um, humor and horror exist side by side. And often it's difficult to determine where humor ends and horror begins and vice versa. And I wanted to, um, to extend an invitation to my readers to contemplate that sort of liminal space between humor and horror through my storytelling. Oh yeah, the, the book is just so brilliant. Again, bri I keep saying the word B, a lot of Bs, brilliant in that. <laughs> it's like, it's this collision of the grotesque and the, just the hilarious, so many different passages. So let's get to some more of your passages. So uh, read us a second passage, tell us the page number so we could all you know, pull out your books or order them already in book <laughs> passage and all that. Um, okay, so um, let's see. I will go ahead and read from um, The Problem of Evil. So The Problem of Evil is, it begins on page 16. Okay. And it is two and a half pages long. So I'll go ahead and read the two and a half pages. Um, and, uh, and, and my brother, sister, and I were raised as Catholics. And that comes through very clearly, I think, in this, in this um, brief chapter, The Problem of Evil. It's okay to be mean. Dad taught me so as he stood at the kitchen counter playing with his watch. I poured a glass of milk, gargled and gulped. I'd emerged from my bedroom after paging through a child's book of saints. Reading about morality had made me thirsty. I swished milk between my cheeks, warming it and thought about the book's martyrs and mystics. I admired them, especially the girls, but a pattern troubled me. Bad things happened to the saintliest ones. Villagers lit them on fire. Pirates and aristocrats raped them. Barbarians carved their breasts and noses off. It seemed that the nicer you were, especially during the Middle Ages, the meaner the world was. Dad, I said, yes. Why does evil exist? 
In just a second, he answered. He multitasked, pondering my inquiry while fiddling with his watch. The lack of a quick response made me uneasy. Through my milk mustache, I blurted, why does God let so many bad things happen? I breathed through my mouth, waited. Dad looked at me with the same face he made when I questioned the Easter Bunny's existence. In a matter of fact voice, he said, Miriam, think of how boring life would be if nothing bad ever happened. His words felt epiphanic. I smiled and my heart felt very, very warm. It was bathing in permission. What an excellent point. Why hadn't I arrived at that conclusion? Dad's words rehabilitated bad things. His logic made them beautiful, necessary in fact. It isn't just greed that's good, mean is good too. Being mean makes us feel alive. It's fun and exciting. Sometimes it keeps us alive. I'll keep reading a little bit more. I'll, I'll read for uh, two more sections. Uh, okay, w just let me know. Yeah, W.H. Auden wrote that evil is unspectacular. I totally disagree. Evil is dazzling. If it's done right, mean can be dazzling too. We act mean to defend ourselves from boredom and from those who would chop off our breasts. We act mean to defend our clubs and institutions. We act mean because we like to laugh. Being mean to boys is fun and a second wave feminist duty. Being rude to men who deserve it is a holy mission. Sisterhood is powerful, but being a bitch is more exhilarating. Being a bitch is spectacular. I'll go ahead and stop there. Um, awesome. It, it, you know, I love the, the diss of Auden talking about evil is un unspectacular. Goes back, you know, the most famous, uh, at least in journalism, the most famous depiction or comment of evil is the banality of evil, which yes. Hannah Arendt talked about at Justice in Nuremberg. So you talk about means virtues, but I got to ask, did Donald Trump ruin mean? <laughs> um, you know, I don't... <laughs> I don't think of him as mean. I think of him as cruel. And I think there's yeah, a difference yeah. between mean and cruel. And I think that there's an artfulness to being mean, but I don't necessarily think that there's an artfulness to cruelty. And to me, mean is like a very sort of campy term. And, um, and Trump isn't necessarily campy. I think some people might describe him as such. I just think of him as tacky, you know? So I think there's a distinction yeah. there. <laughs> that is hilarious. Okay, some more comments from the audience. Uh, a compliment from Carol. Mean is so profound and affected me deeply, Miriam. I want to thank you for your courage and amazing way with words. And I got to talk about the words for a little bit. You have these, you know, you, you have some things are obviously a you know, reflection of your literary background. You read all the greats in English and in Spanish, so you know how to turn a phrase. Other stuff is stream of consciousness. Like the one that made me laugh, you have this comment. I, I think it's an elementary school, definitely. You're facing off against the boys. And one of the, you know, one of the idiots is Raimundo. And here you're talking about Raimundo. And just on one sentence, you're like, oh, this asshole Raimundo, Raimundo. Oh, that means, you know, uh, you know, king, king world. What the hell's up with that? And then, of course, he comes with his comeuppance. Where did you get that sense of humor? I mean, who were, we got your stylistic icons, but let's talk about humor. Where did you get uh, your, your humor aspect? So I think that I come from a funny family and, <laughs> you know, I, and I come from a Mexican family and a Chicano family and Mexicans have a very macabre sense of humor. Like our, our sense yeah. of humor is, is rooted in everything horrible. So Mexicans will take the horrible and then we'll look for the funniest thing in it. Do you know what I mean? Oh yeah. Like um, like there is. I remember like um, I remember one of my uncles. I one of my uncles arguing with my dad, and they were arguing about um something grotesque. They were arguing about Teatro de Goyado in Guadalajara, I think. And um, I, one of the cartels had left a sack with some human heads in it, right? And so they had- Yeah, <laughs> they had I know where this sack. is going. <laughs> but tell it, you gotta tell it because those gabachos no saben. They had, left, they had left a sack of human heads 
And so my dad was mentioning the sack and my Theo was saying, no, 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 you're wrong. And my dad was like, no, 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 I'm right. And they were going back and forth, back and forth about this sack of heads. And then my Theo goes, no, 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 Roberto, they didn't leave it in front of Teatro de Goyado. They left it one block away. So it was that, you know what I mean? Like it just, the, the punchline is in the most absurd, banal sort of like, it, it's, it wasn't about whether or not it was a sack of seven heads or eight heads. It was where the heads got left. You know yeah. what I mean? Like the, these are the people who raised me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like, like they're, they, they find humor in the, the grotesque because you're forced to do that. You're forced to do that when somebody's leaving sacks of heads, you know, <laughs> in front of an opera house. Um, and so, and so, um, humor is something that I've used across my lifespan as a proverbial coping mechanism. Yeah. Um, and uh, and my mother noticed it really early. And this is a story that my mother told me. She said to me that when I was really little, like around five or six, she had noticed that, um, you know, when she would take me to gatherings with adults or cocktail parties or wherever, she noticed that I enjoyed approaching adults, not other children. I would approach adults and I would tell these wild stories, right? And typically they would take a turn for the bizarre and for the grotesque. And my mom wondered if I wasn't a little touched, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. She was like, what is Miriam doing? So she was concerned. And so one day she observed me engaged in this practice, right? So I had staked out who I was gonna go tell my story to. And then when I was finished telling the story, my mom said that she noticed a look of anticipation on my face. And she realized, oh, Miriam's entertaining herself. <laughs> That's what she's doing. And she decided to leave me alone because she recognized that everybody needs a hobby. <laughs> we all need a pastime in life and this was mine. So, you know, I have my family's blessing in being a weirdo, but i um, <laughs> But they're, they're funny. My mom is a really good storyteller. My mom has just a gift of gab. My mom can tell a story for days that never really resolves, but it'll keep you interested because of all the bizarre turns that it takes. And then my dad is much more sort of joke driven and also pun driven. My dad is like master of puns, you know? Yeah, and, and, and in Spanish especially, you have so many different types of puns. You have the albur, which is a sexual type of pun. You have just, to, and we also love just the corniness in the language, but also, oh. you know, we also just love to talk. The, you know, Cantinflas, the legendary Mexican comic, uh, you know, there there's even a verb named after him, cantinflar. And, and cantinflar <laughs> means do talk just to talk. And I didn't see that with your work. I thought every single sentence was specifically constructed with that point. But you were, you were, in a way, you are very much like a comic where you would set up your point, but you always had a punchline just to like, you know, just to make people laugh and push them into that next level or, or whatnot. Yes. Just the, ener the energy of the book is just what's incredible. Yeah. Even at its darkest passages, it just keeps driving. Like, I, I remember, I, you know, I reread it last night and I was starting to fall asleep just because it was like 1130 at night. Then I start getting these passages. I'm like, nope, nope, nope. It just <laughs> took me all the way through. Some of that also comes from having taught high school because I taught high school, public yeah. high school for about 20 years. And when you're a teacher, and especially if you're a teacher who looks like me, right? I'm really petite and I'm femme and I'm Chicana. Like I cannot command attention with my authoritative presence. Look at me for fuck's sake. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I have to hold people's attention using something else. And so I, when I'm in my, when I'm in a classroom, I typically rely on novelty, right? Because novelty always um, inspires curiosity and then humor and wit, you know what I mean? And yeah. you have to be able to outwit the class wit. So you have to be able to one up the class clown if you want to own that room, especially if you're somebody who looks like me, you have to be able to not necessarily put the clown in their place, but you have to be the clown's peer. And yeah. so that that was a lesson. So I've learned a lot from class clowns too. Yeah, no, that's, <laughs> you, you could be any class clown in any, in any room. You would have made a killing 
in Hollywood, that <laughs> decrepit, soulless place, and just own all writers' rooms. But now nah, we, we don't we don't need to lose you to that. So according to my notes, now I'm supposed to ask a big question about California in literature. So let's 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 do it. So where where do you see California literature specifically in the memoir category going through? Because we love our memoirists, we love our Joan Didions, who you have had some br brilliant takedowns. On my Facebook page, one of my friends just hated Miriam just because like, how dare you attack Joan Didion, dude. We all, we, we could all rag on Joan Didion. David, who edited a collection uh, of Joan Didion could, could have her, his Joan Didion jokes. You have, you know, so especially the earliest writings of California in English and in Spanish were all travelogues, memoirs and all that. So where do you see the California memoir going? I, I imagine that California is going to become the epicenter of our, our national literature mm. um, because of demographics and because of the future that demography holds, right? Yeah. Um, w California was the first state to become a quote unquote minority majority state. And um, as California leads, the rest of the United States follows. And there's quite a bit of agitation right now in the literary world to dethrone New York as the publishing industry's capital. I don't know how long it's gonna take to topple New York, but I think that New York will eventually be displaced because we've got uh, the entertainment industry centered here and literature is part of our national entertainment. And so I think that that um, that with enough push um, and uh, enough hard work, um, the literary landscape and the publishing industry's landscape is gonna change and, 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 and we're gonna see sort of a shift in terms of the importance of California. And I really do think that, 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 um, that our nation's literature is going to center California. Uh, give a shout out to an underrated California memoir. Um, Wendy C. Ortiz's Excavation. Yeah. Is an incredibly important memoir. And it is, again, another story of um, Chicana girlhood. And it's a story of Chicana girlhood that is, again, fraught with danger and marked by exploitation. And once again, um, Chicanas have historically been targeted for exploitation of all sorts um, in the US Southwest. And that's the result of, um, of imperialism. I mean, we're a colonized people. So of course that exploitation is gonna persist. And Wendy does an incredibly masterful job of telling uh, the story of her girlhood while simultaneously telling the story of Los Angeles. And those are my favorite sorts of narratives. Narratives that really allow place to become the main character. Yeah. Without the reader necessarily um, being beat over the head with the notion that place is leading and place is protagonist. No, awesome, awesome book. Um, and now, especially with California, since we are such a huge state, there's so many different de de definitions of place. And even within a supposed place, I mean, the, the memoir of somebody of a Chicana who grew up in Caraje is going to be different than one who grew up in East LA, Absolutely. even though they're literally like five miles away, or even in Long Beach, the memoir of somebody who grew up in Cambodia town is going to be different from, say, a middle-class Chicana who grew up in Bixby Knowles. Absolutely. And right now, I'm working on an essay that I'm... Uh, calling not a personal essay, but an interpersonal essay. Hmm. And the essay is being written with my prima hermana, Desi. And Desi was raised in La Mirada and Whittier. And she ran away as a teenager to East Los Angeles and became deeply entrenched in gang life. Hmm. She wants to tell that story. And I'm... Um, and when we were kids, when we were 12 and 13 years old, uh, Desiree and I used to play at gangster. Like some yeah. kids play cops and robbers, 
We played chingona. We played gang. <laughs> and we had a two girl gang. It was called Pocas Pero Locas. Yeah, and a few but crazy. Up, and one of us grew up to be a writer and the other grew up to be a gangster. And she wants to tell her OG story now. So we're going to tell the story as primas hermanas. Oh, that's so awesome. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Bocas, pero locas. That's a, that's actually a great girl gang group, uh, girl it? gang or girl group or lo que sea. Like that's and just we so took awesome. photos too. We took photos. We have a whole shoot of the two of us, and the photos are wild because we have the hair, we have the clothes, we have like these mean looks on our faces. But if you look in our eyes, we are terrified 12 and 13 year olds. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and it's funny. My brother and sister were checking out the photos too. And my brother and sister are going, well, where were we in these photos? And we're like, dumbasses, you guys took the photos. That's why you're not in the photos. We forced you to photograph us. <laughs> oh my God. So we were supposed to end at six, but my note said if this conversation still had gas, we could go on for like 10 more minutes. I say this conversation still has gas. So a couple more questions. Let's go to Marianne. Marianne, and this gets to the big uh, hubbub that uh, Miriam has been involved with these past couple of years in the literary world or the past year. Uh, how difficult was it after the American Dirt essay came out? How difficult is it to be honest these days? And thank you for your fierce honesty. Oh, that is a good question. And I like that she asks about the difficulty of, 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 of um, honesty. So um, being honest uh, comes with a cost. Yeah. So if a person is going to be honest and be very sincere and speak very authentically according to their moral compass, they're they are going to have to pay a price and they're going to have to face certain risks. And I understood that to some extent um, around the time of the publication of the American Dirt essay, I didn't realize how high the cost would be. Um, and, uh, and I discovered that um, once the people in my own community, my own peers began to um, question what I was doing and to critique what I was doing. And so um, that, that was like a difficult moment and I had to, to navigate, um, I had to navigate quite a bit of hostility that came from unforeseen sources. The, the worst kind, the people who you think are gonna have your back or at least agree with you. And nope, they're, they're the ones who put in the knife harder than anyone. Absolutely. And, um, and what surprised me the most was when I did receive um, violent threats or violent insinuations, um, people threatening retaliation for what I had done, I didn't receive support from folks that I thought I was gonna receive support from. So that was surprising. And what I'm gonna say is a cliche that everybody listening is probably familiar with, but it really did a very good job of unmasking for me um, who is brave, who in my world is brave and who in my world and in my circle is a coward. And unfortunately, uh, I learned that the cowards outnumbered uh, the people with courage. Horrible. And how pathetic do you have to be to be an American Dirt fan boy or fan girl to do that? It's, it's horrible. Like, <laughs> not, not, that, really not that abuse is ever good, but for that, like, come on, you're really gonna defend that shit? It's super lame. And then the thing that I really relish reminding people of is that I did not pan American Dirt. In fact, I endorsed it because I said it is the perfect book for your local self-righteous gringa book club. <laughs> so if that's not an endorsement, I don't know what is. 
And California Book Club is not a white gringa, you know, lame <laughs> gringa book club. Otherwise, we wouldn't have someone like Miriam. So that's that's absolutely hilarious. Uh, we have, one of the things that I, you know, we're almost out of time here, but one of the things I love about Miriam, and I said this earlier, was just her knowledge of literature and just that, you know, just brutal takedown. So, and I told her this via, you know, uh, we didn't really rehearse any of these questions, but the one thing I did tell her on Twitter via DM is like, I want to do a lightning round with you. Just, I'm going to put up an author that you trashed in mean and just quick, quick responses to why. And, you know, some of them were surprising. Some of them made me laugh. So uh, Gertrude Stein. Oh my God. I, I actually do like Gertrude Stein a lot. I like what she does with language and I love her repetitions. So I admit, yeah. I love her repetitions uh, and I love her look. I love that butch look. <laughs> 1920s <laughs> with Alice Pitolkas. Charles Dickens, A Tale of Two Cities. Uh, I couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. It was assigned my sophomore year, and I was like, "Fuck, Madame Defarge, I can't do this. Too much knitting." <laughs> you described it as all you remember was beheading and knitting. <laughs> that just completely made me laugh. Um, I couldn't tell if you liked Hart Crane or not, and since I read that late at nine, I'm like, "Oh, are you hating on Ambrose Bierce? Because Ambrose Bierce was a G." You know? It wasn't that I was hating on him. What I was, what the reason that I brought up Ambrose Bierce was because. He seemed to me to be this Anglo-American with a death wish. And he went to Mexico to execute that death wish. Yeah. And that's disappointing. It's like, you <laughs> want to kill yourself, kill yourself at home. Don't go use Mexico as your toilet. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, <laughs> so that was the only beef that I really had with, with Bierce. And then Hart Crane, Hart Crane, I just feel sorry for. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because I'm... Um, to. To be, I mean, to be a queer poet living in that time, like, I mean, of course he threw himself over the side of a boat. Like, I probably would have too, you know what I yeah. mean? So. Well, yeah. yes, seriously, at that time, what else can you do, sadly? Exactly. And then the one that made me laugh the loudest, and again, it gets, it is a great way to conclude, because I think it just wraps up everything that Mean is, both the brilliance and just like the brutality of it, Richard Rodriguez. Oh. <gasps> Oh my God. Well, go oh. off on this thing and I'm going to say what your line was about Richard Rodriguez. I can't stand him. Um, the hunger of memory, dude, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, God. Oh, so when I was at Cal, that memoir was one of the only works on any syllabi written by a Chicano. Mm. And I was like, of all the bullshit to feed to us, you're gonna give us Mr. Fuck Affirmative Action? This is what you're gonna give us? And I remember I went to a professor's office to talk to him about it and he was kind of taken aback. I was like 18 or 19 years old and he was like this geezer who was like an institution in the history department. And I was just like, sir, you need to fix your syllabus. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I like, I, I gave him some suggestions of things to replace it with, but I was like, of all, all the things to give us, you're gonna give us this offensive text. And didn't he teach at Stanford? Yeah, I mean, he, for a little- That's he, our yeah. foe, that's Berkeley's foe. Why are you gonna give us <laughs> a from our rival school? <laughs> and then the line that you had, that this is what had me rolling. So you mentioned Richard Rodriguez, and then you say, I'd rather read Richard Ramirez. <laughs> the, the night stalker again you read that and this like night stalker it. is one of the worst serial definitely like he was the the boogeyman of my childhood in southern california growing up in the 80s there is nothing funny about him whatsoever but when you put it in that way you're rolling on the ground laughing you're like oh my god that's beyond the pale but fuck was that fucking funny thank you i have a piece coming out i think it might publish tomorrow on jezebel yeah. About the the Richard Ramirez Netflix series. Oh yeah. Did you see it? Did you no, watch it? No, no, is it good? It's trash. <laughs> it's just it's for murder heads. It's hyper voyeurist voyeuristic. And it basically just jerks off the sheriffs. Do you know what I mean? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. That, that's right. why I don't like, like get the true fuck crime. out of here. The sheriffs are so great. So I eviscerate it. So that is, <laughs> so that's, that might publish tomorrow on Jezebel. 
All right, folks. And then last thing for you, Miriam, if people want to catch up with everything you write, how can they uh, keep up with you? Um, I'm really active on Twitter. My handle is lesbrains. So you can find me there. And then if you want to see pictures of me in a bikini, you can follow me on Instagram. I, <laughs> I'm alt Miriam Gerba 666. And then I have a Facebook, which is really tame because uh, all my extended family <laughs> is always dropping into my Facebook shit. And um, I also am the editor in chief of a magazine of criticism, commentary, and social analysis called Tasteful Rude. I occasionally publish myself. Um, today's piece is an essay on uh, racial politics in Texas and the polar vortex. So mm. I, I invite y'all to check it out. Awesome. And then final comment from one of the readers, Mean feels like it gave me permission for the way that I already think and privately cope with my experience. So Miriam, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. I'll, I'll, always great to talk. We got it. Once this stupid pandemic's over, let's catch up and uh, hablamos. Definitely. Thank you so much. All right, David, take it away. All right. Thanks, Gustavo. Thank you, Miriam. That was a remarkable conversation. Thanks to both of you for, for being here. Um, this, com this interview will be up at CaliforniaBookClub.com if you want to revisit it. Uh, next month's book is The Mars Room by Rachel Kushner, and that uh, book club event will be on uh, May 20th. Um, a reminder on the sale for Alta membership for CBC members at altaonline.com slash CBC offer. And please participate in a two minute survey that will pop up as soon as this event ends. Stay safe, stay well, get vaccinated. See you next month. <laughs>